Good morning, everyone, and welcoming to our hurricane preparedness for county extension agents in sheltering hub counties. This is Joyce Cavanaugh and Andy Vestal. Great. So we're happy to have you with us this morning. We're going to go ahead and um, get started with our briefing. Our goals for today to our to um, remind you about family preparedness plans, helping you to understand the state of Texas sheltering plan and how you and your county fit within that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the general information related to public sheltering, uh, what your roles and responsibilities are during an event where people are evacuated to your in your area, and then review some of our Texas Eden resources that are on our texashealth.tamu.edu website. Just want to remind you about how Extension fits within the whole emergency management framework. Um, many of you have hopefully seen this graphic before in our EM 101 102 courses. Um, each of these pillars represents a piece of the whole emergency management framework. So we prepared mitigation response recovery. The size of the bar reflects involved in extension in those pieces of that whole framework. So obviously, we fix our efforts on preparedness, um, public information about getting being prepared, um, mitigation, how to reduce the effects of disaster through either making modifications to their home or their property, um, response uh, receiver, a much less involvement in response. Not first responders, and primarily our role response, especially related to hurricanes, may revolve around um, altering of the animals and livestock. That's a very small piece and not something that we are heavily involved in in the separate. And then obviously involvement related to recovery following an event, providing public education and, and information and resources for people on how they can recover. Um, your priority is to your family in these areas. So um, making sure that your family is prepared. your second priority, especially in a recovery, is to um, respond to the kinds of requests made by your county judge, who is the person in your county related to emergency management. Just kind of want to preparedness plans, because uh, even if you're, you know, even though you're a sheltering county and maybe directly impact by, in this case, a hurricane. Uh, there will be other disasters that you can be directly affected, or if you're a member of a team and are deployed, you want to make sure that you your families are prepared. So as well as families that are working in the community. Um, these are some of the resources that we want to refer you to. Uh, Texans Red our revision of the preparing for the unexpected list that many of you can remember if you've been around um past five to six years of us being involved in emergency management. Uh it's a, a smaller piece and uh, this this one goes with families text at Red E six twenty seven the version is only the Spanish version is available in print from the bookstore without downloading electronically. Do copies of Preparing for the Unexpected available, and if you are working with groups where you think providing that um, bulk is appropriate, then we know we 
Um, it's so important to help these identifications and making sure that arrangements. Um, anyone with who need assistance during disaster should register with local two one one. And then making sure that one has reviewed um, annual basis current cover system sure that um, insurance for themselves and their property. A few items that need to be included and uh, worked on related prepared plan. Um, understanding that there are issues and people will be um, recommended that evacuate or maybe mandatory evacuation plan. Other things will be made by to shelter. Um, people need to make sure they have access to size, a minimum of three days. Um, they have the pets as well, and that they and they can put out of go box in addition to that have a go box primarily focused on financial and personal records. I'm making sure they have a communication plan that if the reporting happens of several permit shelters that they have plan in on how they can take and make and that it then is accounting safe. Oh, just kind of a summary of some of the items that would go in that grab and go box. Um, for, you know, we've taught all of these resources, including a fact sheet on compiling the grab and go box, are on the Texas Eden site. On the public side, um, remember there are resources also on the employee login side where you log in using your county name and your county office zip code. And there are also educational materials for providing a presentation on preparing um, general financial, or excuse me, general emergency preparedness and developing a disaster supply kit, as well as a presentation on financial emergency preparedness that goes into much more depth on the grab and go box. Okay, Andy, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, I uh, just wanted to show you this slide to give you a, a little bit of illustration of one you expect uh, the peak hurricane season to take place. This is a pretty simple 100 year storm uh, uh, history. And you can see that we're just now entering uh, the time period when we have some threatened uh, periods. Certainly the uh, mass amount of, of uh, storms happened uh, about mid-August to mid-October. And uh, you can see the numbers there. I won't go into any more detail. But I just wanted to illustrate this to show, so you certainly see uh, what we get prepared for through doing these presentations. Go forward. Uh, the next slide is uh, you can see on the left, it's uh, the number of fatalities over a period of 1970 to 1999 uh, from tropical cyclones. And you can see uh, that would be anything from a tropical depression to a hurricane and the related flooding and that kind of relationship even inland. But the uh, fatality uh, graphic on the left illustrates that significantly the uh, death loss to the human population, of course, is based, you know, caused by water for the most part. Uh, wind is a, is a is next level of, of impact or threat, and certainly tornadoes and other incidents such as automobile accidents and or other related. Uh, on the right, you see fatalities based on location. You would think that the coastal communities are most impacted. Uh, they are most threatened as far as damage to uh, property, but it's not the largest number of fatalities. The inland counties is where we find the most fatalities. And you can see uh, that, that number there. Just think this is a good illustration. So it's important for you guys because y'all are not necessarily right on the coast and you have difficulty letting people know that how much of a threat it might be 
to be in a low-lying area or other type of incident. Because water flooding and water uh, flash flooding just seems to be a, a significant impact in it. Next slide. We wanted to, to know a little bit about the lingo and the timetables that the state of Texas, Texas Division of Emergency Management and the State Operations Center uh, use as a timeline for hurricane uh, response, recovery, evacuation, and sheltering. And we use some terminology. Uh, H is the H hour. Uh, you can see there described in the middle of the page. But H minus 72 to H minus 40 means 72 hours to 40 hours prior uh, to the H hour. We see that the evacuation occurs and contraflow might be authorized. We'll learn about contraflow in a moment. H minus 36, which would be about uh, a day and a half before expected landfall of 39 mile an hour winds, state of Texas resources cease to operate in the impact zone. So if you're going to need somebody to rescue you, <laughs> you had better get out of there before that time because uh, the state of Texas resources, the, the boats, the helicopters, other resources to help you evacuate will discontinue operations because of the threat to the first responders. The H hour itself is, uh, is that uh, when the winds get 39 miles per hour or greater at, uh, on the Texas coast, that's the call of the H hour. It's not necessarily when the eye of the storm hits, but it uh, could be a, a quite a number of hours before that time. Coastal evacuation routes are inundated by tropical storm surge at that time, and certainly response operations or generally cease due to the unsafe conditions. Re-entry hour, we call it R hour. Re-entry hour are the conditions whereby it's safe enough to operate the rescue or the safe, the re reestablish rescue and search operations. And the re-entry might be when utility personnel and road and bridge crews and that kind of thing can re-enter. R hour is not the time at which the citizens can go back into neighborhoods because we don't have any resources there to support them. The R hour is, is certainly a 12 to 24 hours after the eye of the storm passes through the impacted zones. So keep that in mind, R hour. The R plus 72, which would be about three days or two days, two and a half, three days after uh, R hour, uh, the citizens are most likely to be able to get back into their properties. So uh, allowing citizens to go in earlier when we don't have uh, road and bridge and when we have flooding and when we don't have electricity and we don't have sewer and we don't have food resources, uh, we do, the state of Texas uh, emergency management plan has in it that we don't let citizens back into their own properties even until the infrastructure is supported to the Okay, next slide. I think this slide is an important slide for you and for you to share with your population as you do presentations in the county. Uh, and you can see it's uh, information about uh, the population activities during Hurricane Rita in 2005 in the state of Texas. You can see the number of people who left at H minus 120 about five days before uh, landfall, not very many. But you can look down there at H minus 48 to H minus 24. Most people wait a day or two before landfall to make an effort to, to evacuate. And boy, by that time, the uh, highways are already clogged. And then uh, uh, just one day before, 20 hours before land, uh, landfall of 39 mile an hour winds, uh, a lower percentage, percentage. So if you wait to that H minus 48, you're probably going to be on the, on the road like my nephew was trying to get out of Humble. Took him 11 hours to get from Humble, Texas to College Station. So uh, probably better to leave at 72 hours before. The state of Texas, when they send buses to pick up uh, 211 registrants, those people that uh, need help evacuating, when they send buses, those buses go out there 
at, at least by X minus 96 to X minus 72, and they want to be completely out of there by X minus 46 or 48. So they want to try to get all those buses and all those people out early rather than late. Next slide. This slide kind of illustrates to you uh, the, in the state plan there are particular evacuation hubs. And those there, there are five evacuation hubs. One of them, you see the little circle in the, the very lower portion of the state, and that's going to be the Rio Grande Valley hub. I don't, I don't think some circles are on this slide. They were on my earlier slide this morning. But the Rio Grande Valley hub, basically that green area down low. The Sabine or Beaumont area hub is a combination of colors up there in, in southeast Texas. But you can see we have uh, hubs, uh, five of them, generally when a, a system, a tropical storm system or hurricane hits the coast, it might impact maybe two of these hubs. So state resources are activated, for example, if this, if there's a lower Rio Grande Valley hurricane, we might activate the uh, South Texas hub in Rio Grande Valley and the coastal being hub. Therefore, we know we're going to send the buses. We know, we know we're going to have to activate uh, transportation services for the 2.1 uh, registrants that need transportation. And we know where the automobiles are going to fill the traffic arteries throughout that part of the region. Notice also that the state of Texas plan has in it the direction in which traffic flow is supposed to go. And in all cases, it's going to go toward I-35. Some of it's going to go northward. Some of it's going to go uh, 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 somewhat northwest. But notice that the folks in Houston are going to be directed north rather than toward Austin. So if you wait to that H minus uh, 48 hours, the state may not allow you to go to Austin and stay with your family. You might have to go to Longview, or you might have to go to the Dallas-Fort Worth area because crossing traffic reduces the efficiency of the evacuation itself. So we want traffic flow to not be crossing itself as, as little as possible anyway. If you want, want to go to Austin and you're in Houston, you better get out of there much earlier than the 48-hour period. Next slide. What you're looking at here are the sheltering hubs that are identified in the state emergency management plan. And certainly these hubs have a host county, for example, Smith County and Tyler. And then uh, those hubs, those counties that are uh, contiguous counties to Smith County would support that hub by offering state sheltering resources. And what that means is a community center, or an athletic facility, or a convention center, or that kind of resource in that county might be a part of the state sheltering plan. Other locations in the county might choose not to submit or commit their resources to the state supported sheltering plan, and we'll describe that, uh, the difference here in a few moments. But uh, these are the locations, and that's why you're online to discuss with us today, because most of the people who are going to evacuate the coastal areas of the state during a hurricane are going to be uh, directed toward these hubs where we have significant hotels for the general population or significant family relationships or other relationships and then significant sheltering that is state and local supported. Next slide. But then we have a tier two sheltering capability that's in the state emergency management plan. And these are in Amarillo, El Paso, Odessa, Midland, Lubbock. These are for air evacuation. And that would be when we have medical evacuation in Corpus Christi. We, those individuals might be uh, shipped by a C-130 by Texas military forces to the Lubbock International Airport. And, be sheltered in the Lubbock area by that county uh, during the time in which the storm enters and, and uh, leaves the impact zone. So keep that in mind. We won't talk about that much more, but uh, you can see uh, that's a plan for air evacuation that's related to medical evacuees. Next slide. Another important, important resource to you as a county agent and as a responder, if you're on a strike team and going back down into the location, or if you're, you evacuated your, 
your citizens and want to get back into your property or it back into your office. And, and if you're in uh, Chambers County, for example, the state of Texas, TexDOT, has this slide, this resource online so that you can see where the arteries are clogged and where they're not clogged. And you can see if you were wanting to go to Nacogdoches on I-59 out of the Houston area uh, at this point in time, you're probably not going to move very fast. That red line on, I on uh, Highway 59 out of Houston uh, north is really clogged up on, on the outbound. You can see this is probably a, an, a, 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 an example of the presentation of the website TxDOT prior to ContraFlow. And ContraFlow would uh, make all lanes exit toward the north only. We'll talk about that shortly. Go ahead, next slide. Contraflow, here are the main arteries for contraflow. That, and contraflow would be something that's designated by Texas Department of Public Safety in cooperation with local governments to uh, make all lanes in these major arteries uh, flow one direction. Uh, what that means is everybody will be on the road going one direction, and it's a real challenge, but it's, a, it's one more way to get more people out of those particular regions of the state that are uh, threatened significantly by the hurricane. It will happen about H minus 60 to H minus 40 hours before uh, the impact zone, but it may continue once it started, it may continue from H minus 40 all the way down to the H hour. Okay, next slide. I'll describe this uh, in terms of what's happening downstate for most of you all. You're located where the state sheltering plan has shelter. So up here in the, where you see the green rectangles, that's where you are, back in uh, Smith County, back in Tarrant County, back in Vail County, back in Bear County, or wherever your location is supporting those major hubs. Uh, you may have some state shelters. Uh, a community center might have committed their state shelter resource to the state plan. And what happens is you see a reception area probably in your county. A bus would show up at your reception area and send them to the state shelter. You see a bus fuel point uh, is in the state plan. So that if it's a long, direct, long trip, then there is a fuel point, which would mean a rest stop also for restroom breaks in our uh, water refreshments or whatsoever if, if they're trying to exit through the Rondi Valley and get all the way up to Austin, for example, and it's a long trip. Then down here where you see the hubs, that would be that back in the evacuation counties, Wharton County, uh, uh, Calhoun County, in San Patricio County, and uh, uh, even down in the very lower Rondi counties, these hubs would be stood up by Texas military forces, now called Texas Department of Military, and they would operate in some pre-designated areas. Uh, maybe a high school in Harlingen would be a hub. And individuals that have registered for 211 uh, assistance from the state uh, for uh, transportation and evacuation, they would be transported by local sheriff's departments, local volunteers, local transit authorities, and local police departments to the hub. And then once they get to the hub, then they will be identified, placed in a bus, and moved to the state shelters in Smith County or in Bell County or in Webb County, for example. So that gives you an idea of what's happening with state evacuation planning. Move forward. I'm going to let uh, Joyce share this information. Uh Okay, so there are basically two types of shelters. There are state shelters designated within the state plan, which are the destinations for those people who are provided transportation to evacuate by the states, um, as well as people who have special needs and are registered with 211 to have assistance evacuating, and then again, the medical um, needs population of evacuees, which um, may be air evacuated or um, evacuated with bus or other types of road transportation. So people who are, 
relying on the state um, for assistance in evacuating, they're going to go to shelters pre-designated in those sheltering hub areas that, that Andy showed on the prior slide. Um, those shelters are designated in the state plan. For the general population that evacuates toward those areas, um, those shelters are part of local plans, local emergency management plans. Um, there may also be some point-to-point -point sheltering where, for example, there is a nursing home in Galveston that has a relationship with one of our local churches here in College Station. So that when Galveston has a mandatory evacuation or an evacuation recommendation and that nursing home is evacuating, they're evacuating their residents to the church here on College Station. That is a local resource and that's a, um, a relationship that they have developed. Some of our animal and um, companion animal and livestock sheltering is also designated within local plans. For the um, state sheltering and mass care within the state plan that happens in those shelter hub circles on that map, those um, the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army have state responsibility for those shelters, standing up those shelters, supporting them, making sure they have the supplies, et cetera, that they need. Um, on the more local level with sheltering, a lot of those local shelters um, for the general population are organized through other local church and faith-based organizations as well as other community groups, civic organizations, churches, communities that, that stand up, community centers, et cetera. But um, this, for the state plan and the state shelters, the Red Cross and the Salvation Army are the two um, lead agencies. For people who are transported as part of the state plan on those buses that Andy was um, talking about, um, all of those folks receive a tracking bracelet similar to this when they board the bus. And they're supposed to keep that bracelet with them on their person um, until the buses bring them back home um, to their, their hub. Um, this is all part of our um, emergency plan as a way of making sure that all of those people can be accounted for. Some of the guidelines that are used with those is that families are never separated. So Family members all are made sure they're on the same bus. This assures that they're all at the same shelter because every bus that leaves one of those evacuation hubs, not all of those buses are going to end up at the same shelter. So we want to make sure that, that families are not separated and that they end up on the same bus and at the same shelter. For medical evacuees, they are allowed to have one family caregiver accompany them or a caregiver accompany them. They or may not be a family member. They may have private caregivers. Um, each evacuee's equipment and their medication is, is tagged with them and with their family units. Companion animals are tagged with their family units so that um, we make sure that they're not separated. Uh, evacuees are advised not to discard their bracelet, not to exchange their bands, because that band is their ticket back, their bus ticket back home. So if they show up to board the bus again and um, they're without their band, then that's going to result in some um, problems for them. Uh, we talked about local sheltering and care as um, the general population that evacuates in their own vehicle um, approaches an area where they're hoping to shelter, like for example here in College Station, um, there is a checkpoint at the south end of College Station in Bryan where people will stop and register and check in and then they'll be directed to local shelters that have space. So these kinds of arrangements happen in other communities as well so that 
if people have hotel arrangements, then you know they can get to their hotel. But if they're needing a shelter, then those local organizations that have stood up shelters are where those folks will be directed. Um, these are usually, like we said earlier, community and faith-based organizations who are not part of that state plan, so they're not receiving any state support um, to run their shelter. But they're a major um, and very important part of um, being able to shelter all evacuees. A lot of those organizations, including the Red Cross and the um, Salvation Army, are part of a statewide network of VOADs. Um, that acronym, V-O-A-D, stands for Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. There's a national organization, then we have the state organization in Texas, and then there are some local um, VOADs or increasingly called COADs for county organizations active in disaster popping up across the state. This is a kind of a national effort within the National VOAD organization to filter these organizations down since we know that most disasters end up being handled at the local level. Um, not, you know, we're not just talking about hurricanes, but other more smaller, more local disasters, then having those networks at the the county or in, and local community level um, can fill an important role in recovery. So if you you may know of these groups that are starting in your in your communities in your county, um, I would encourage you if you're not aware to kind of start asking questions of some of those groups that would be participating, like the Salvation Army or the Red Cross, um, to see where you might fit within your county. Um, organization as a way of um, getting into the network, um, into that coalition. Okay, I'll turn it back to you, Andy. Okay, uh, just one, what we've just been through, the, the presentation so far is just focused on uh, ele elevating your awareness of what is in the state emergency management plan for evacuation and sheltering. And I think that's important for us to be aware of. It's important for us to share with our communities. And uh, certainly uh, uh, we can help help in crisis times uh, much better when we're aware of these kind of situations. The next part, a few minutes of the presentation will be about the county extension agent roles and responsibilities. And certainly your foremost role and responsibility begins with your relationship with your county judge and your county emergency management coordinator. At least one county agent, uh, the emergency management court, the, the, the extension agent who lives, is the office coordinator uh, and, and county coordinator for the county extension office uh, should sustain a relationship with the county uh, judge and the county emergency management coordinator. And if the ag agent is uh, different than who the, who the coordinator is, that ag agent should have a relationship to support animal issues planning in response and recovery uh, with that county emergency management coordinator and county judge. Oftentimes, county extension agents, especially along the coast, have, are called into the county emergency operations center uh, to serve as public information officer. And that's not always the case, but many of you may be involved in that role at, at times. But even if you're not designated as the public information officer, you still can be a part of public information. Just make sure you're connected with the EOC so that you're relaying the appropriate information about the incident. Uh, we usually don't worry about uh, sharing our educational materials. We can always share our educational materials. But when we're sharing information about the incident, about loss numbers about what we should do next, we always want to be plugged into the public information officer that is at the County Emergency Operations Center to get the right information out. Next slide. Our, our ag agent, or in some cases 4-H agent in every county, has a responsibility to support uh, animal issues uh, planning, and animal issues uh, plans, uh, the activation of the plan. 
and in every county in the state in 2006, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service made a commitment to the State Animal Health Commission, Texas Animal Health Commission, to and our commitment was to assist, assist local county emergency management coordinators to establish a county animal issues committee in a county. And then that county animal issues committee was to support the county emergency management coordinator to write county animal response plans, a plan for carcass disposal, a plan for what, what resources do we need to have uh, accessible to us to stand up a companion animal shelter, a livestock shelter for larger animals, or companion animal feed in veterinary resources, and livestock feed in veterinary resources. So these county animal response plans are developed uh, through engagement with the appropriate people on animal issues committees at the county level. That's our commitment extension. We did not make a commitment that we would run the shelter and that we would run everything related to animal issues. We committed to helping to establish a committee that supports animal issues, uh, the emergency management coordinator to do so. But in some cases, county extension agents do take a significant role in leadership for companion animal or livestock animal response plan and the activation of that plan. What we do ask too, is that you in the county establish plan for donations management for a companion animal shelter or livestock shelter and establish at the local level, not a new 501c3, but a relationship with an existing 501c3 organization that could serve as the receiver and the uh, receipt rider for the donations to the livestock response effort or the companion animal response effort. And there may be a 501c3 that you already know of in the county that can serve that need. So that's an important thing. For example, it might be the sheriff's posse or the rodeo organization in the county. The uh, animal sheltering, you see, we talked a little bit about that in the four, number five is 4 H recreation guides. Those of you, all of you all are in sheltering areas. And what we ask you to do is use the yay 4 H recreation guides throughout the year uh, and, and help to uh, help the local sheltering groups as well as the state sheltering groups be aware of and be prepared to use those 4-H uh, yay recreation guides in the shelters with the children, children who are there for days, days on end. And we're not asking you as a county agent to deliver it to the children, but you to be a trainer for the volunteers that go to these shelters and serve that need. Next slide. We pretty much talked about number six already. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but uh, I think the number one thing there for you to know is that as a local county extension agent on the coast or even up, up into inland where you all are, you may have to, you have a need to establish a livestock a supply point or a livestock care shelter or something of that sort. And if you do that, uh, probably the Animal Health Commission is going to be uh, establishing their state animal response team. Once they decide to deploy a team to your county, what we ask them to do is to contact the local county extension agent, agriculture or 4 H, and establish that relationship so that that county extension agent is automatically a member of the state animal response team. If it's an extended type of a multi-day event, then a livestock specialist out of our personnel at the Animal Science Department, a TSCRA special ranger, which is the Cattlemen's, Texas and Southwestern Cattlemen's Association, and the Texas Department of Agriculture, they all may have a person on that team to support the state animal response team, which is the earliest team that goes in to do damage assessment and livestock assessment and request the resources to address that need. Number seven uh, is role is to understand the state emergency management protocols. Be prepared to use the state of Texas assistant request uh, forms. 
they call them star farms. It's a simple farm, but it's uh, something the county agents can help draft the language for to request educational publications from an extension at the state level and a county agent strike team at the state level or a high 4x4 four four vehicle or a high profile vehicle on extension uh, to move around in your county when times are a crisis are taking place or of extension an extension uh, specialist of a certain kind that are needed for the county but to request through using the star farms even if you're requesting feed resource or feed donations that kind of thing they too have to have a star farm signed by the county judge county or the emc and the county judge gets that star farm to the DDC, the district executive committee, and then on to the SOC. But that's the protocol for that. Next. Uh, what we want to do here is make sure you aware, are aware of these particular protocols, aware of this information, and uh, have a general awareness of it. We will have a handbook that will go out to each of you, uh, as well as a uh, downloadable version of the handbook for sheltering counties uh, on the employee, on a, employee side of Texas Eden. Joyce, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Wrap it up. Okay. Uh, at this point, we want to open up if anybody has any questions, um, if you have any needs that, that you'd like to share, please do that in the chat box. Um, and we'll see if we get any responses. We will be sending out, um, in addition to the, the information on the handbook, um, a copy of the presentation as well as um, the link to the recording so that others can view the recording um, at a later date. So. Uh, have seen no questions. I'm gonna please always feel free if you if anything comes up or um, issues that you need help dealing with, um, feel free to contact me or Andy, and we'll do what we can to help. But seeing no questions, we will call this briefing to an end. So thank you all for participating.